Janet Forrest. Welcome to The Shelves of Yore. This week, we once again return to the year 1841. Just to give you a sense of time and place, the Athenaeum is a private club. Whaling has brought significant wealth and prosperity to the Grey Lady, and there's a thriving island community. But for all the resources and wealth, there is still no safe and reliable transportation between Nantucket and the mainland. Imagine it. No direct flights to New York or fast ferries to Hyannis. True, several companies managed to get a vessel running back and forth, but the trip took at least eight hours, and the business ventures eventually went broke. 30 miles out to sea is starting to sound a lot more isolating, huh? And yet, and yet, Nantucketers were not isolationists. They weren't the townies of yore. This was an island of explorers and prospectors and adventurers. Though they lived in a small remote place, their reach was global. So it's only natural that the Athenaeum's 1841 catalog would reflect that worldliness. With reference library associate Jim Borzileri's help, I singled out three items that illustrate how cosmopolitan islanders were at the time. We will follow the travels of Captain Jay Cook, Sir Frederick William Beachy, and Baptist minister Howard Malcolm. I asked Jim to start by telling me about a 1796 volume titled A Voyage to the Pacific Ocean for making discoveries in the Northern Hemisphere. It was compiled by George William Anderson based on the journals of Captain James Cook. But first, Jim wanted to give a little more historical context. When the Athenaeum was founded in the 1830s, uh, still a good chunk of the world was unknown to at least Europeans and Americans. And even parts that were known were not really documented. They hadn't been chartered. They hadn't been surveyed yet. So things like tidal currents, winds, seasonal weather patterns, things that would be of great interest to Nantucketers and their whale ships uh, were still kind of unknown. And as a result, the major European powers were still sending out official expeditions to explore, uh, and at least early on, uh, certainly during the time of Captain Cook, try and claim uh, undiscovered territories, but in all cases to chart and map these lands. And over time, uh, what began to happen is these expeditions became a little less about claiming territory and a little bit more about filling the scientific and commercial interests. Uh, and one thing they were all searching for at this time was what was called the Northwest Passage, which they thought would be the shortcut across America between the Atlantic and the Pacific. The attempts to find this had actually gone back to Columbus, who, after all, was trying to find a shortcut to India. So he wasn't particularly happy to discover there was this whole continent in the way. Today, of course, we've got the Panama Canal. But prior to 1914, when it was completed, you had two choices if you were in, let's say, London or even New York. One was to sail down around the coast of South America around Cape Horn, which was very, very treacherous and long because you're literally sailing you know, across another continent. The other was to go east uh, and go around Africa, around the Cape of Good Hope. So it was a little less dangerous, but it was, you know, you're basically going around two thirds of the world to get to the Pacific. So uh, during this time, of course, Nantucketers had been venturing more and more into the Pacific. The Atlantic whaling grounds had been fished out and starting uh, just before Captain Cook's uh, expeditions, they had pushed their way into the Pacific and were slowly working their way up the coast of South America. So naturally, anything that Cook was doing uh, was would be of great interest to him. And I think everyone's kind of heard the name Cook. And if they think about it at all, they might think about Hawaii. That's one of the things he is known for. Uh, he would make three uh, separate expeditions to the Pacific. Uh, and on one of them, he would actually discover, at least from a European perspective, uh, the Hawaiian Islands. He also sailed, made contact with the east coastline of Australia, and he also made the first recorded trip around New Zealand. People kind of knew where it was, but he was the first one to sort of sail around it. But his third voyage was to try and find this Northwest Passage. He was sent up to the North Pacific to try and see if there was an opening 
you know, that was relatively free of ice that would allow them to sail across North America and end up in the Atlantic. We don't know too much about that particular voyage, the third one. We know that it didn't go as well as he had hoped. There may have been weather issues. The ice was probably getting in the way. He may have had some, self, some health issues himself. So he decided to go back to Hawaii. Uh, unfortunately, while he was there, his crew was refitting the ship and they took some wood from a sacred burial ground. The Hawaiians uh, retaliated by stealing a boat. Things escalated from there and uh, regrettably, Captain Cook was killed. He sort of left a legacy of, you know, the fact that he was employing scientific techniques as well as a methodology that would extend well into the 20th century. And the way this book is cataloged as I'm looking at it, it looks like this is by Captain James Cook, but it's actually, it was published post-mortem and talk about it, it was, it's considered the Anderson Cook uh, an Anderson Cook publication. So explain what that means. Yeah, so what happened is, as, as you mentioned, uh, earlier volumes had been published after each of the trips, but they tended to be very large and very, very expensive. And George William Anderson was an editor who thought he could put out an affordable edition. This collection of his voyages, as you said, are known as the Anderson's Cook. Uh, what's interesting also is the title. And again, this came out in 19... Uh, 1796. It's 132 words. I'm not going to read all of it, but just to give you a flavor, I'll read you the first part. A new, authentic, and complete collection of voyages round the world, undertaken and performed by royal authority, containing a new, authentic, entertaining, instructive, full, and complete historical account of Captain Cook's first, second, third, and last voyages, undertaken by order of his present majesty for making new discoveries in geography, navigation, astronomy, etc., in the southern and northern hemispheres, etc., etc., etc. And it goes on <laughs> from there. So that kind of gives you a sense of how he's marketing this, that this is a complete telling, uh, it's entertaining, it's instructive. In terms of technique, he used the original journals that came from Cook and other members of his expedition, but he had them rewritten. And then he also had them supplemented with other materials. So to your point, it's not so much by Cook as about Cook, but it was designed to be uh, affordable. It was originally published in 80 serialized, well, we'll call them pamphlets or small magazines uh, and sold by subscription. And then it was bound and sold as a single edition. Uh, and just to make it more exciting, he uh, threw in accounts from some other voyages of other explorers, uh, one of whom was Francis Drake. When we hear of Cook or the, you know, the 1790s, we think this is all ancient history. But if anybody's recently watched uh, the Beatles documentary that uh, Jackson put together, I think it's on the Disney Channel, the Get Back documentary, which is a great little show. That documentary of the recording of that album is as far from us as Cook's voyages were from the Nantucketers in the Athenaeum. So it's not that long. And just as everybody today, even if they may not own every single Beatles recording, they certainly know who the Beatles are. And they can probably, you know, tell you about several songs that they know and perhaps even like. So this is not current events, but it's very, very recent and still within recent living memory of quite a few Nantucketers. Well, and when I look at this title, I guess in my head, I imagined a member of the Athenaeum sitting down, reading this book and envisioning a world they hadn't seen, but that's mm -hmm. not true. A lot of these people that were members of the Athenaeum probably would have seen these places, probably would have traveled quite a bit. Oh yeah, absolutely. If they'd been on the whaling trips, then this was areas they knew. And they might even look at it and say, hmm, well, he got this part wrong. You know, yeah, this, I can see why he put it down this way, but yeah, and oh, look how much that's built up. You know, look at that. You know, it's there used to be no one there. Now we've got a nice little whaling station out there. We know that Captain James Cook died in 1779 in Hawaii. And it would so his time traveling around the world ended but mm -hmm. the work he did and the knowledge people would gain didn't end there no and the expeditions from england certainly continued they were almost you know they were just sort of ongoing uh which almost which kind of brings us up to our next book by uh, beachy this is published in 1831 uh, it's not as long as uh, the Cook title, so I'll just I'll just read out the key points, which is narrative of a voyage to the Pacific in Bering Strait to cooperate with the polar expeditions performed in His Majesty's ship Blossom under the command of Captain F.W. Beachy, and, and it goes on from there. But this is sort of the key point. 
Beachy was assigned by the Admiralty to explore the Bering Strait, but in coordination with two other ships from the British Navy that were already there on their own expeditions, uh, commanded by Captains Perry and Franklin. So this is not just a single, I'm going solo kind of voyage. This is now a coordinated effort to not just look for new territory, but to begin to map and chart what's out there and to see, hopefully, if they can find a relatively ice-free passage that will serve as, as, you know, a way to get to the Atlantic Ocean. When I was looking into Captain James Cook's voyage and what was going on and obviously how it ended, it seemed very fraught and rugged and kind of chaotic. Mm -hmm. And as I looked into Beachy's travels and his logs, it, it's less chaotic, it's more calculated. And as you had said before, uh, that he was more of, about cartography, really about mapping um, what Cook, basically what Cook had found. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the fact that there are three ships out there going back to territory that Cook's expedition, along with some later ones, had already mapped out. So they're not so much you know, pushing into new lands. They're not going to discover another Hawaii. But now they're just going back and really trying to document as carefully as possible, you know, what are the conditions? What does the land look like? And in Beachy, in some ways, is well suited uh, as a cartographer because uh, it kind of runs in the family. Both his parents were professional pa were painters, so you know he comes from a line of artists. Uh, he got into the navy when he was about ten years old, uh, and so he was relatively young when he was given command of the Blossom and, and sent out. Uh, the particular expedition he was on spanned from 1825 to 1828. So to your point, we're, you know, we're a full lifetime ahead of where Cook was. What makes his book particularly interesting is he didn't just look at the, the Northwest uh, Passage, uh, the Alaska or the North Pacific. He actually ranged across uh, all of the Pacific. He would visit Pitcairn Island, Easter Island, the Society Islands, Tahiti, what was then Sandwich Islands, now Hawaii. And then he also made it to the outskirts of China, to two places that Europeans could go. He went to Macau, he also went to Canton, and he somehow skirted by Okinawa, which was, I think, the one open port in Japan. Uh, and then he would come back and map the coast of California, which was, of course, then was still part of Mexico. So, you know, you know, he's really going beyond just exploring. And this is also a very long ranging expedition to be out there for three years is, is quite an undertaking. Let me talk a little bit about what happened with the other expeditions, because I mentioned Franklin, and that might trigger some memories for some people, because in a, a later expedition in 1845, uh, Franklin would uh, come to a disastrous end. He took two ships in and they basically disappeared. Uh, we know later from later events that the ships were trapped in the ice and destroyed. The crew, tr some of the crew members tried to make their way to the mainland and none survived. And so there were repeated expeditions after that to try and, uh, you know, figure out what happened. And, you know, it, it's kind of ironic that in one of them, they would actually find a viable Northeast, a, a passage through the Northwest, but they had to cheat to use sleds. So it wasn't until 1906 that someone actually demonstrated that when the ice is clear, you can use this Northwest Passage. So Jim, the irony in all this is Nantucket actually benefited from not finding the Northwest Passage sooner because what did they find instead? Well, what they found was gold. Uh, because if you think about it, in the late 1840s, after the fire, uh, while that was going on, the whales were disappearing from the Atlantic. The Nantucket whaling industry itself was in really rough shape. Things had transitioned to uh, New Bedford and most of the Nantucket ships were laying idle. And then suddenly in 1849, word gets to the east that gold has been discovered in California. And overnight there are, without exaggeration, tens of thousands of would-be prospectors who are saying, I will give you all of my money if you can get me on a ship that will safely get me to California ahead of everybody else. Plus, you've got merchants who are realizing that if they can get their goods out there, they can sell them for something like 10 times what they would be selling for in New York or Boston or Rio. So here are Nantucketers who have had these decades of experience making the trip around Cape Horn, which was incredibly dangerous in ships that were designed to survive the trip. And when they got there, San Francisco Bay, which was a pretty treacherous place to come into, that was a routine port of call. They knew how to navigate through it. So they refitted the ships. And in many cases, they made a profit before the ship even left the dock. 
which, you know, given they're in an industry where you're sending something out and maybe three years later, you might make a profit of this was like a, a, you know, this was like a windfall to them. And once they got out there, many of them transitioned to either the merchant marine or they became merchants themselves. So as Nantucket starts to really fall apart from the whaling industry, they're out there making new fortunes. Yeah, they really didn't miss a beat, huh? No, they got lucky. <laughs> Okay, the final volume we had to talk about is a little bit of a departure. It's Howard Malcolm's Travels in the Southeastern Asia Embracing Hindustan, Malaya, Siam, and China. And he's he's different in many ways. The thing that stood out to me was that he really didn't come from a military background. He was uh, uh, a Baptist. He was a minister and was Correct. out doing missionary work. So talk a little bit about who Howard Malcolm was. Well, yeah, you know, as, as you said, uh, he was a, a Baptist missionary. He was born in 1799. He attended uh, Princeton Theological Seminary, received his degree, and slowly moved up the ranks in uh, the Baptist faith. And he became a general agent and then was secretary of the American Baptist Sunday School Union. Uh, and then he became a deputy of the Baptist Missionary Society. And in 1835, he was assigned to travel to Asia to study uh, the efforts that were going on by the Baptist missionaries to convert the people in Asia to Christianity. And this was really unlike the earlier expeditions, which, you know, were governmental uh, and sometimes military. He was basically, I wouldn't quite call it a tourist, but he traveled by a commercial boat on what would be a fact-finding mission. So he's traveling around the various parts of Asia, but even though he's alone, he's taking advantage of the other Americans and the other Europeans who are already there on the ground, in particular, the missionaries, as well as some of the other uh, commercial merchants that he might have encountered. So it's a completely different program because rather than explore territory, he's really trying to, to understand what's effective and what's ineffective in their efforts to convert the Asians to Christianity. In a way, Captain Cook was blazing the trail and discovering everything. Beachy came behind him and mapped everything. And Howard Malcolm used those maps and went around spreading Christianity. I mean, that was a hope. And also, I mean, people were really ahead of him. So he was just checking in on what had already been established. You know, he's almost like a management consultant looking around and saying, what's working, what's not working? What can we do to make this a little more effective? But along the way, he had decided that he also wanted to document, at least from his perspective, uh, the culture, the history, uh, the peoples that he found, where they were, you know, something that might be interesting about them. And it's written as a journal. So it's, you know, I did this this day, I did this that day. The other thing that makes it, I think, uh, useful for to contemporize is he was actually a fairly skilled artist. And along the way, he just made sketches. And a lot of these sketches were then reproduced in the book. And some of them are really quite nice. So, you know, if perhaps some of the written material is of less interest to contemporary eyes, you do have these drawings to fall back on it. In some cases, you know, he was, he was documenting things that perhaps people weren't thinking to document. The local boats, the kind of wagons people use, certainly the pagodas and other things he found of interest. So it was, you know, it's kind of an interesting assortment of what he, he put on the page. As we look back on missionaries, there's some skepticism around intention and all that. But I think it's important to note that he he did do a lot of unpopular, but good, I guess you'd consider good work back in the United States. He helped found the first Black Baptist church. He also found a women's academy that was associated with Georgetown. It's interesting to look at him as a person and with a little bit of nuance of he wasn't just your average missionary going around trying to convert people. He had done a lot of what would have been at the time unpopular work as well. Very unpopular because when he came back to America, he was, I think, the president of a college in Kentucky, and he had to resign because of his abolitionist views. This was about 1849, 1850. And when you read his actual uh, books that he wrote about his travels in Asia, you know, he sees everybody as human beings, at least, you know, that puts him ahead of quite a few others of his time. So yeah, we can't judge him by contemporary standards. And as someone once said, if you judge everybody in the past, they're all going to get canceled for one thing or another. But I think in his case, he seems to be a little more humane, a little more empathic and a little more, he tends to, you know, willing to regard everybody as, you know, as truly human beings and capable at least of, you know, of redemption. 
that said, he was trying to convert them to Christianity and move away from not just their faith, but their culture in many cases. So that has to be sort of, you know, it's not a balancing act, but I think we just have to sort of take that into account and say, there's this and there's that. And this is, this is the man and this is what he wrote. And the book as it is, is, you know, on those grounds, fairly interesting. If we had this volume, what interest would it be to a modern reader? What, you know, what would I get out of reading it today? Well, it's in many ways an interesting travel log because he is describing, you know, life on the ground in Asia in the 1830s. He tends to consort and talk with other expatriate Westerners. So you, you, there is that. Rarely do you hear a description of what's happening through the eyes and ears of you know, someone who is actually native to that area. He, in fact, he goes out of his way to say, I usually don't include quotations from people who are Asian because that's being documented elsewhere. He's more interested in what's going on with the missionaries and their efforts. So you've got this two part of the book, but there are sections that are just sort of fascinating. I know it's perhaps sort of the, the inadvertent parts of the travel log. It's sort of like if you see an old movie that's filmed in New York in 1950, maybe the movie's not very good, but the background is fascinating. And you're saying, wait, that's an L, you know, that's an automat. And it's sort of interesting for that reason. And he does include the drawings. And that makes it kind of interesting as well. As we mentioned before, Nantucketers weren't local yokels. They they lived on Nantucket, but they were all very well educated. Not all. Many were well educated. Many were well traveled. It wasn't. They weren't reading this the way someone might read National Geographic. They were reading it as if, oh, all right, next time I go there, I'll look for this, or they yep. didn't quite map this right. What is it about Nantucketers that just created this? culture of exploring and going far away, even though they live on this tiny little island? Uh, I think it was necessity and opportunity. The necessity was if you go way back to when the European, again, this is the Europeans, but when the Europeans came to the island, they thought they'd be farmers and then discovered that you really can't grow crops here, and let alone raise sheep. So they had to find something else to do. And the Native Americans had been doing drift whaling, which is when a whale you know, comes ashore, they would take advantage of it and butcher it. And they just started using boats and the boats ranged farther and farther offshore. And they started getting really good at it. And sperm whaling was something that they kind of pioneered. And sperm whales can be, as we know, fairly dangerous if they feel they're, they're being attacked. But the Nantucketers somehow, because of their culture, because they were all probably related to each other, because of the skills that were handed down, uh, we're just far and, you know, far, far, far ahead of any of the other nations that tried to catch up with them and get into the whaling business. And nobody really succeeded until just about the end of the Nantucket whaling period, about the 1850s, the British sperm whaling industry finally caught up with them. But up to that point, as dangerous as it was, the Nantucketers kind of had the market to themselves. So I think they were somewhat predisposed to travel. And as I said, they just started making a lot of money and then they made even more money than they thought they would make. And it's, it was dangerous, but they, they had the tools, they had the abilities, they had the skills, and they were constantly improving it and constantly reinvesting in everything they had. So I think it just kind of got a momentum on its own. So by the time we get to the founding of the Athenaeum, you've got a culture that's in place that is very entrepreneurial, very outwardly facing, very globally aware of every little nuance that could affect their business. You know, Spain goes to war with France that, you know, and they decide to attack Nantucket whale ships, that's going to be a problem. So they're paying attention to anything and everything that's going on in the outside world because they know they are right on the razor's edge. You know, they, they had two very real lessons. I mean, they were almost wiped out in the Revolutionary War and they they came almost as close in the War of 1812. So, you know, they knew that if things went haywire, they, you know, they could be in big trouble. This has been a production of the Nantucket Athenaeum. It was written, narrated, and edited by me, Janet Forrest. Special thanks to Jim Borzilleri for sharing his research, knowledge, and charming radio voice. The Nantucket Athenaeum is located at 1 India Street in Nantucket, Massachusetts. We would love for you to stop by. Join me next week to see what else you can find on the shelves of yore.